And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we present ourselves before you as sons. We pray that you would visit us now. We sit at your feet to receive the ingraft word. We pray that you would speak to us sharply about the things that are necessary for us to learn and comfort us in all of our tribulation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have gotten as far as uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so we'll bring that up. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So that's a list of four categories. I'm, I think there are more uh, in the scriptures. So supplication simply means I have something I need and want, and supplication is the process of seeking someone at a higher position who has the power uh, to grant you your request. And it's interesting that the Bible then lists prayers, which implies they're not exactly the same thing. And so I would think one distinct difference in praying is that there are a wide range of things that can be said where you're just not seeking the, for something for someone, either yourself or someone else. And so the word prayer means a, a petition. Uh, and intercession, that's when you stand between some the Lord and someone else, and you uh, you pray on their behalf. You pray as though they are the ones who are praying. Uh, you're a substitute, and so it's kind of like an attorney in a court that pleads a a, a client's case, and we have that power and authority to take up causes that other people are engaged in and assume the responsibility of praying for them. And so uh, one of the skills of life in the spirit is being successfully aware when someone needs prayer. And uh, sometimes the Lord will simply prompt you. Sometimes you'll see something in your circumstances and you realize, I need to pray for them. And then the giving of thanks. That's just general thankfulness. Uh, Lord, I thank you for everything. I thank you for doing this yesterday. I thank you for leading and guiding me. But I don't think these are, I don't think this is a complete list. I think Paul, is, the Holy Spirit, is just kind of gesturing uh, that these are important enough, at least in chapter two, to list them. Now, the unusual thing is that he then asks that these be made for all men. So the question is, is that all men? Is it all men in the church? Is it uh, limited in some sort of way? And I think as you go on, it appears as though the Lord means all men. And I'm not sure we take up that obligation very quickly, that there are dire needs around the globe. And you can assume that some of the needs that you're going through are uh, the same needs in Botswana or Brazil or Cameroon Islands. And so those who have a gift of prayer, I think, should make a note. It kind of should be on a checklist of uh, praying for all men, just referring a general blessing, a general opening of the gospel, a general reception. Uh, because as we see, the Lord wants everyone saved. He's not parceling it out. Uh, 
uh, based on performance, but he has the desire that they all be safe. And of course, we know that won't happen. <clears throat> the book of Revelation gives a list of what qualifies you for the lake of fire. And that's, a, that's an interesting list to look at. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So I think here in the United States, we're seeing a deterioration of the ability to lead a quiet and peaceable life. And so um, what we do about it, I think, is do some discussion. I, I'm a little cautious. Some are pushing forward pretty hard and fast and maybe they have a calling to do so. But on the other hand, holding back is exactly what happened to the Christian church in Germany when Hitler took over. Uh, they could not act. They did not act. They were frozen in their beliefs. And they had a belief system that said that it really isn't proper for Christians to interact with the law, with the government. And so some lament that, uh, namely Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who took the exact opposite posture, and that is he did what he could and was finally executed uh, because of that. So don't be surprised that, say, maybe in the next uh, two, five, ten years, that the, the body of Christ will become engaged in that as a subject more and more, and of course, we have to be on guard. Just because a lot of people are talking about it doesn't mean that necessarily what everyone has to say is useful for us. So I think all the more we need to be prepared ourselves. And I think, I think spending time discussing it among ourselves is, is suitable. But living a peaceable life in godliness and honesty is, uh, the fruit of our prayer for our government. And so uh, we have some obligation to uh, add our part. We don't know what the Lord is doing. My inkling is two things, and I've mentioned this before. One is that he's judging the United States, and second, that he's judging the church. And so what proportion of those is it 50-50 or is it more our fault? I don't know. Uh, but I'd like for you to hold that uh, gingerly, carefully, and see if the Lord won't uh, amplify it in uh, days, weeks, months, and years that are ahead. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of the Lord, the uh, sight of God our Savior. What's unusual there, uh, we know the Lord proclaimed, especially in the uh, creation, the Lord saw that it was good. And uh, then when he made man, he said it was very good. But there's an unusual word there, and that's the word acceptable. Uh, that's a measure. That's, uh, well, let's see, is that good? Is that okay? Uh, it's acceptable, <laughs> you know. It's it's a notch or two down. Uh, so I'd have to say, in my general reading of the scriptures, I wasn't aware of of that kind of concept. That well, okay, yeah, we'll do it. I'll agree. We'll do it your way, you know, because uh, you're so used to. You know, this is the way walk you in it. So I just wonder how much latitude that gives us and how much of our current Christian faith is him yielding and being merciful and say, okay, I'll accept it. It's not the best, but at least it's there and uh, I can use it. And uh, So it, it passes muster, uh, however ba uh, barely. So... <clears throat> who will have all men to be saved. And so that couples with the notion of praying for all men and come to the 
unto the knowledge of the truth. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the, sa the Savior of all men. And John it says that uh, he is the light of all men. And so his view of the world, uh, he doesn't isolate us between saint and sinner, but rather uh, we occupy a rank. We occupy a certain point on a path which we are traveling. And we have traveled further than when we had begun. Hopefully that, that's what's happening. Others haven't even begun yet. And so uh, he's not fussed and tapping his fingers, what's the matter with him? But has a plan for each one as to how he will introduce them to the Lord. And we could probably go around the room now and uh, and listen. You know what? What did it take for you? What what clicked? What was that thing? Uh, the aha moment, as as they call it. And I doubt that any two of us will be the same. And so, I think I've shared it before. For me, I did not know that the Lord wanted me to serve him. No one ever told me that. I figured the professionals follow God, and then they, they'll tell me what to do. That was my model. And so when I read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, it, it was great news. Me, moi, uh, couldn't believe it, but I did believe it. And so that's, uh, that's how the adventure began. Others, uh, it's a drama of wrestling against sin or a great deliverance or the peace of God that passes understanding. It's, uh, he's a fisherman, and you don't use the same bait for all fish. Uh, I was listening to a fisherman today at, at a men's meeting and uh, how exacting the, the rod and reel really was deep sea fishing. <laughs> He was able to describe the process at length of what it takes to catch a fish. So, so the, the Lord of all, he probably has a greater panoply of, uh, of capability of drawing people to himself. And I think he probably finds it a, it a delight. Yeah, this one, I think I'll draw him this way. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus. And this is not meant to be a sterile, uh, this is all that's working, uh, because we are called to mediate. We are called to stand before the Lord and, and others. And so I think the point here is the, is the singleness. The, the, there's just one occasion of the power in the universe. There's one God. And his son is a mediator. And according to Romans 8, he's not the only mediator. That The Holy Spirit also prays for us, intercedes for us. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And a ransom is what you pay someone when you've been kidnapped. And so Adam and Eve, they let the kidnapper in and took took us hostage against everything, against everything that's honorable, against everything that's pure, and we got stuck. And so evidently, spiritually, there is some sort of demand of payment to release us. And Jesus paid it. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So he gave himself as that ransom. He the value of his blood is incredible and has the ability to purchase redemption for all men, all mankind, for all time. And so it's no, uh, no small thing. And it's interesting that the Lord himself picks, it says, to be testified in due time. He picked the timing. It was after the Maccabees and uh 
Roman Empire, and he picked a time that also was rather ugly concerning tyranny in the government. And uh, he hardly paid it any mind. Oh, uh, whose inscription's on that coin? Well, I'll give the Caesar what's, yeah, that, we'll take care of that, you know. Or uh, go, go fishing and uh, you'll find a coin in his mouth and we'll, we'll be squared away. What a life we could lead if some of that was true from day to day. But I think, uh, I think it's withheld because it's not time. I think uh, there are great things coming, but we are in a day where our individual preparation is designed to cut a path through a wilderness so that those who are behind us have a guidance. And so I don't particularly agree with The majority who feel that the Lord's coming any minute now, uh, someone mentioned about the Lord coming quickly. Uh, That word quickly isn't like the snap of a finger. It's not a split second. It's not that kind of quickly. The Greek is the same word as that we get tachometer, which measures the speed of an engine or tachycardia, and that's when your heart is beating too fast. When he comes, he comes quickly. <laughs> he, he, it's schmuck schnell. It's not, uh, he doesn't whistle a happy tune walking down the lane and casually come. He comes quickly. The, the start of his coming and the end of his coming, bang, it's there. So, but there's no reference that that means that it's a, a day or two from now or at least a year. So, there's there's nothing of that. Behold, I come quickly. It's the same word uh, in, in the book of Revelation. So there's a time and a season for everything. And so uh, part of the burden that we have is to grasp what our mission is. What is it? What contribution are we called to make? What deposit can we leave with the body of Christ? so that there is yet one more step that's taken. Uh, Because I don't think the church is anywhere near its uh, its promised uh, status in the world. and So uh, that is yet to come. So we'll see. And if he comes tomorrow and we all go to heaven the next day, then you can say, I told you so. I'll I'll accept it. I'll I'll eat humble pie. Whereunto I am ordained a pastor, and the process of ordination is an essential one. You don't want to be a lone ranger. You don't want to take, no man takes this authority on himself. You want to have the conference of authority placed on you by others, and it's safe. It's safe to be examined by others and having them determine uh, to what extent you are suitable for a particular uh, kind of ministry. And I think the growing habit, I haven't heard a recent number. The last number I heard was, uh, I think it was 60 million, that there are 60 million born-again believers that are not attending church. And so... That's a display of their dissatisfaction. It's, you know, why, why bother? Same old, same old. I, I hunger for more and I can't get it. So I can see that. But what it does, I, I just recommend you seek the Lord. Just seek the Lord and say, Lord, I, I don't think this is particularly safe, but I, I want to find a place that you place me where I can be seen and evaluated and have uh, the capability of serving you conferred upon me by those that are uh, in authority. And it's acceptable to humble ourselves and allow that process to take. Uh, I think the modern church is way too resistant 
to the authority of the church. So, uh, and maybe rightfully so. Sure would hate to get uh, directed improperly by foolish and carnal leadership. So it's a, it's an adventure, <clears throat> but one I think you should take to the Lord and press press it through, uh, because Jesus was introduced to a society that was far from the Lord, and so he went about under the anointing, and he submitted himself to the temple. He remember he. Uh, I think very respectfully uh, debated and, and maybe even instructed uh, the the priest in the temple. And so he uh, was very respectful before Pilate. He, uh, so it could be that with the present distress that the Lord is going to instruct us maybe a little more clearly so that we get it, that it might be time to um, accept a yoke that normally we would want to throw off. So I'm ordained a preacher and apostle in other places. He says he's a teacher and uh, an evangelist. And I speak the truth in Christ, and I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth, faith and verity. Gaining a view of what your calling is, is essential. And it's easy to kind of flow with your current circumstances. You know, if it turns right, you turn right with it. Uh, I urge you to take the time <clears throat> to ask the Lord to clarify your calling. Lord, make it clear enough that even I can understand it so that you can, with deliberateness and with devotion and faith, uh, press, press the issue with the Lord. And he may have something for you which is just contrary to your inclination. Uh, you may delight, for example, in teaching, and he may send you uh, in a different capacity. And so... It's essential for you to understand the hope of your calling and then give yourself to it. And if, if you feel in doubt, take that doubt to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I don't like this. I don't like, you know, every day just seems to be the same. I'm drifting. I don't feel a commission. I don't feel a destiny. I don't feel a mantle uh, has come upon me. It needs to be pursued. Uh, just like Elisha pursued uh, Elijah. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere. And so that's, there's more than one reference in the Bible that we ought to always be praying. And this adds to it, it should be everywhere as well. So uh, uh, learning to walk before the throne is a special skill for the believer, where you see the world around you, you're interacting with the world around you, but at the same time, your position is actually before the throne. That's where you really are. That's where your identity is. And that is where you, you receive your, uh, your instructions. And so that connection needs to be there all the time. And so it's probably a great area where we are unskilled. And so... There again, ask the Lord, say, Lord, I, I don't like being in the dark all the time. You know, can I get a clue from time to time? You know, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just before he was uh, executed, wrote to a friend and said, are we of no further use? And so knowing that you're in God's hands and that you are fulfilling his purpose, is a good thing, but there's a price to be paid to attain it. Uh, requires vigilance, holiness, faith, courage, strength. The men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands. And so, are your hands holy? Uh, 
the things that you touch, the things that you do with your hands, do they, do they honor the Lord? And probably the number one topic in the scriptures is the requirement that we walk in holiness. And uh, I like the idea of lifting your hands to the Lord. And, uh, it's a sign of honor and it, it's positional. It's, uh, it looks up and it, it's a posture of receiving, uh, lifting holy hands. And so the key of worship is body posture. If you look up in the scriptures, the word worship, you'll find it, I think every time I have to double check that it has something to do with your bodily posture. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, that met, uh, Was it Rebecca? Uh, and he was leaning on his staff, worshiping God. And so he was elderly. And so that was, that was his posture to worship the Lord. Without wrath and doubting. And the Christian is called to lead a life that's pure. And we need to be honest. If we have a fault, a, a, some call it a besetting sin. And it's something that happens again and again, and you fight it, and you pray about it, and it just doesn't seem to budge. And so learning how to conquer that is an essential part of the Christian life and is one of the reasons why we need each other, because others can help in that process. So there's deliverance in the prayers of your uh, brothers and sisters. In like manner also that women adore themselves in modest apparel, we saw that elsewhere, with shamefacedness, that's just simply a humility and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Uh, he used to call it putting on the ritz. Yeah, here's my, ta-da, look at me, here I am. But the ladies are called to adorn themselves with modesty, sobriety. And Paul has uh, some more to say about the ladies, so ladies, uh, fasten your seatbelt. But which becomes women professing godliness with good work. And so doing good. Remember, Jesus went about doing good. And ask the Lord, what, what can I do today that's just simply a favor, it's just something uh, that will assist someone else? Not that it's about me and not that secretly I'll, I'll get the benefit, but just a beneficial action toward others that a lot of times the Lord will lead you to it with something that's totally unexpected. And the person that receives it is just overwhelmed with delight. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. So here we go. Our society is redefining humanity. And they've gone way, 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 way too far. So, but God's position is that every gender, the two genders, have a specific purpose. And he's made men stronger, for example, physically stronger, so that they can do stronger work. And ladies are more delicate. Uh, I like to say he made the ladies beautiful, which he has. <laughs> so uh, I don't think you can say amen that they're beautiful. Uh, but getting Adam was first made and then Eve we'll see that it says. And so there's a hierarchy that is easily uh, viewed as being either dictatorial or I'm something and you're nothing. None of that is true. It's more like uh, if a train has to be guided, you have an engineer and you have a fireman, you have conductors, 
they, they, they are commissioned with the task. And in that, one of them has rank. I, I think uh, the engineer does. Or in an aircraft, the pilot has the rank over the navigator and over the uh, co-pilot. And so the same is true with gender. God has made Adam first. And because of that, there is a requirement that's placed on mankind, the men, that is not placed on women. And also there is a requirement laid on the ladies that is not laid on men. There are other areas where we are both required in, in the same way. But one of the things that society will do, if it can, is to get that out of order without it being um, dictatorial or demeaning. That's, uh, that's not the point. And so let the women learn in silence. Uh, Larry was uh, editing an old tape I had made years ago. And uh, there was one gal who just kept taking me on. <laughs> it's like, uh, let me teach, you know, let me make my point. You know, I have, a, I have an agenda. But uh, everything was challenged. And, oh, what you're saying is this and what you're saying that. And it, it just simply is unseemly. And so uh, I think, Larry, you had to edit it all out. Is that right? Yep, he's saying, yeah. So it, it was unseemly. And so I tried to be as gentle as I could. Uh, so men have weaknesses and the ladies have weaknesses. The men have strength and the ladies have strength. And so the Bible addresses all of those. And so don't feel, I think some, and we'll see an example here where, where my opinion about some of these things is opposite from uh, the, the general uh, understanding, uh, but we'll get to that. So I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So this one is a haymaker. This one, many denominations just bang. Oh, you know, you're done. You know, you have nothing to say. And I don't think that's what it says. And so what I did, and I didn't do this on the original. Uh, but I hope you can see it on, on the display. I put some red parentheses. And I think the reading is grouped. And there's a modulating phrase that applies all the way down rather than being isolated, which most do. So if I were to reread this, as I feel what it's saying in English and in the Greek, I suffer not a woman to teach over a man, nor to usurp authority over the man. And so that is inappropriate. Uh, and it's not to say that you have nothing to say, but don't assert yourself and take away, it robs the man of the position that God has given him. And so it's an abuse. Rather, if things are occurring in the spirit, the ladies will be given permission. Though, uh, in fact, I think that's the word in uh, talks about a woman that prophesies uh, that she has to have something on her head. I think the Greek word there is permission. She needs permission on her head, and so the ladies have a great deal to contribute. But there's a, a mechanism by which that can be. Uh, abused by simply asserting yourself too quickly, too aggressively, and not allowing God's process, which is simply God will reveal to leadership, uh, you know, Sister Sally, boy, she knew how to prophesy. We, we ought to just let her go. Uh, and that, uh, that's the normal by, way by which uh, the, the ladies are engaged. But I don't think it's a statement that uh, women can't teach. I don't think that's the case at all. For Adam was first formed and then Eve. Uh, that's the logic. And elsewhere it says, uh, the head of the woman is the man and the head of every man is Christ. And so just picture that as 
functionary. It's, uh, it's a duty. Uh, there is a realm over which you have been given insight and capacity to serve. And so trying to reach beyond that um, becomes a problem. One of God's judgments on Israel, he threatens them. He says, if you disobey me, you will be ruled by women and children. See, it's upside down. It's not, uh, it just is not suitable. And so it, it does not mean at all that there's any harshness or any demining, you know, diminu diminution of, uh, of any gifting. It just has to do with, is it proper? Is there, is there a mechanism for permission? And I think the ladies ought to be free to ask permission. That's not abusive at all. And Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She, <laughs> I don't want to say she was clueless, but she, uh, she got tricked. And it just sounded so good, but not Adam. Adam knew exactly what was going on. And so, uh, that's why Jesus is called the second Adam. He's, uh, he came to fix that, uh, that uh, disobedience, because Adam did it on purpose. He knew what God said. He knew the serpent was lying, but he did it anyway. So the whole world collapsed because of that. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. And so that's, that's just a comment of functionality. Uh, the ladies are designed to bear children, and some can and some can't. And so that's not exactly the point. The point is rather uh, your physical frame gives a very strong hint as to the purpose of your frame. And does that mean it's the only purpose that you can't be fulfilled in other areas? I don't think there's even a hint of that in, in the scriptures. But nonetheless, uh, one of the trends here in the United States is that uh, the birth rate is declining somewhat rapidly. So I think it's right on the edge of, uh, of our population shrinking. And Europe has already gone through that. Europe's birth rate is way low. Uh, but not among the, the Muslims, not among the Catholics. So they, they, uh, they have a different vision. If they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So, uh, the virtuous woman, read that in, uh, in Proverbs. It's, uh, she is so delightful, such a wonder. Uh, she's worth dying for. Yeah, that's how precious the ladies are. But she still is called to faith, to love and holiness and a sobriety here means uh, not giddy, not flighty, uh, but one that regards things seriously. Well, it says in the in the uh, Proverbs about women, they consider a field and they purchase it. So that shows there's great skill and uh, ability to assess and take action and see that there's a, something profitable that's occurring. Chapter 3, <clears throat> this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And what's unusual about that is that I think we tend to limit God to, um, well, I'm called this and I'm called that. And it was he decides all the time and everywhere how we are to function. This implies that it's okay to have a hankering. It's okay to say, you know what, Lord? And I, I think he does that. I think he shows you an office and you instinctively identify with it. It's like, it's like you say, I can do that. Uh, and so having that desire, he says, is a good thing. It's a good work. It's, uh, don't be ashamed. Uh, you're going to have to learn. People are going to have to recognize your capability in the Lord, 
but nonetheless there's a blessing upon the one who is casting about and looking for things that are more honorable, more responsible. A bishop then must be blameless. And a, we've said before, a bishop, the word is episcopal. Epi means on top. Scopal means, like telescope, means to see. And so in English, we have two parallels, super vision. So super is above and vision is seeing. And then the other is, um, I forgot, oversight. Episcopal oversight. So the word bishop means that. So a bishop is a rank that oversees uh, the affairs of the church and possibly is the number one in a particular region. The modern church, except for some uh, denominations maybe in the South, uh, we don't even consider a bishop as anything. It's uh, We've uh, settled on the concept of a pastor. And so we'll see how that works. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the word pastor is only used once in the Bible. So it's not, you know, there's the presbytery, there are bishops, there are elders, there are deacons. And so the way the scriptures organize the assembly of the saints isn't necessarily matched that well with the modern practice. The husband of one wife, and I've said that before, my opinion that that's not talking about divorce. I think it's talking about bigamy. And one reason is, and I had a conversation with a brother who was very intense on the evil of, of a divorce. And boy, it just ruins everything. And, uh, I think to the extent that they uh, kicked him out of the church. And I asked him a question and he didn't answer. I said, is divorce an unforgivable sin? I don't think so. I think there's one unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So it takes wisdom, it takes leadership, but if someone is snared in the divorce process, sometimes they have no choice. It's not something they can uh, control. Sometimes there's incredible abuse. And so the safest way to proceed is to seek church leadership and pour out your case and get some support, get some guidance in the matter uh, so that the matter can get behind you. Sometimes there are ingredients involving life and death that uh, the separation is required. The husband of one wife, vigilant, don't give up, keep keep pressing. Uh, they're always there when you ask. They're always there, always there. Sober, not giddy, hardy har har, of good behavior, given to hospitality. You feel comfortable when you're around them and apt to teach. And I don't know what to make of that. The word apt kind of suggests, well, we'll, we'll put a little of that on them. Uh, because when you have the ministry of teaching, it's like, uh, that's the burden. You know, man, what does that mean? You know, it's like, but a bishop, you know, it's apt, apt to teach. I, I like that. And I think many, many gifts are that way. You have an apt, aptitude toward, uh, prophecy or an aptitude toward healing or deliverance. Not given to wine. Of course, alcohol is the, one of the big questions. Uh, no striker. Uh, no temper here. Not guilty of filthy lucre. I think I've shared with you before I heard on TV, guy had a brand new scheme. He called it reverse tithing. He said, you send me a $1,000, and I'll send you $100 back. That's reverse tithing, brother. So, I don't think so. You know, that's greedy, a filthy lugar. How did he dream that up? I mean, 
Wait, did he find it in a book? Or, uh, did that come from his heart? But patient. Let patience have her perfect work. And I think what I like about the concept of patience is that it's one of the easiest virtues to detect yourself how well you're doing. You can tell when impatience is intruding. And so not all sins are that way. Some sins just blindside you and bang, you're in. And it's, oh, man, why did I do that? Lying can be that way. Just the pressure's on. And if you tell your boss it's four, but it was really two, uh, you'll buy some time. So that's kind of like a sudden uh, capture of the enemy. But patience, uh, you, there's a metric there that you can sense uh, how well you're doing. And according to the scriptures, patience then is the virtue that enables you to walk perfectly before the Lord. Let patience have her perfect work that you might be, was it uh, thorough, entire, lacking nothing. Not a brawler. Boy, is that inconsistent. I wonder what the difference is between being a striker and a brawler. Maybe somebody can do that for homework. Uh, and not covetous. Just, he doesn't have his fingerprints all over possessions, but it's all, it's all relaxed. One that rules well his own house, and that's the quality, a quality for a number of positions in the church. Uh, the Lord figures if you can't oversee your own home, how are you going to oversee the house of God? Having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know, silly children are an annoyance, and, and it's not profitable. They're, they're not growing well. Uh, so gravity is, uh, helps them to evaluate uh, realistically what's before them. For if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So, uh, that's a metric, and it's one, if you're struggling with, uh, go to the Lord and ask him, you know, I kind of feel like the children are, oh, you know, uh, help me, <laughs> help me uh, get my arms around it, and help me to lead, help me to influence in a godly way rather than a demanding way. Not a novice. And boy, is that a prominent topic in the scriptures. <clears throat> you start at the beginning. You start with nothing, and you get added to this, added, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. And the thing about beginners, if you give a beginner responsibility, this says, They'll be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. It's, it's just too much. And you may think, well, I'm being real generous here. You know, let's be inclusive. And, you know, come on, Brother Fred, you know, who doesn't know uh, his hand from his glove? It's, uh, and, and the enemy steps in. It's the condemnation of the devil. Uh, it evidently turns a switch on and empowers the enemy. Uh, to establish con uh, condemnation, judgment against the individual. The inference is, is that it, it takes hold. He, he gets wounded by these strikes. So be patient with your development in serving the Lord. And be patient when others don't quite see what you're capable of. You can see it, but they can't. And so... Uh, just be willing to say, the back seat is fine. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, and that is essential. Uh, Jesus' testimony was that he had, the, as a boy, had the favor of God in men. And so, be careful if there's angst that's present between you and the unsaved. Uh, inspect that carefully and ask the Lord, what can I do? Uh, because if someone goes to them and says, what do you think of Brother Fred? Uh, 
according to this, they should say, you know, he's not bad. He's, he's a genuine fellow. You know, I like him. So that's, a, that's a good report. But if they wince and roll their eyes and say, oh, that Fred, <laughs> well, you know, I don't have anything to say. You know, <laughs> that's not a good report. So be, be attentive to your relationship with the unsaved. There's value there. And I think the Lord then uses you an example. When they see holiness, I think the Lord goes to them and says, do you see that? Isn't that something? Wouldn't you like something like that? You can, you know, and lure them. We're called uh, fishermen. And so you may be part of the bait. Lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. So that's the second time the devil is mentioned as it's like some sort of advancement in, uh, in capability. He's given permission. And in this case here, it's reproach and a snare. You get trapped. Likewise, must the deacons. Now, a deacon is a different, different position. Uh, a deacon is, uh, a deacon can have significant duties in the church. And I think sometimes we make the deacon, you know, uh, set up the tables for the evening meeting or, uh, I don't know, kind of the nitty gritty of church life. Uh, but the deacon is simply a pastor who is not exposed yet to all of the circumstances, but he is quite skilled in many things that are spiritual. In some denominations, it's a great honor to be a deacon. Others make it just kind of like a helper. Uh, but they must be great, serious people, not double-tongued. You can shoot, you can believe what they say, not given to much wine, there it is again, and not greedy of filthy lucre. There that is again. So the love of money is the root of all evil. And Believe that. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Boy, having a pure conscience is worth its weight in gold. There's no weight. Oh, there I go again. And Am I ever going to? Oh, oh my, oh my, oh my. Uh, a pure conscience means that you can search yourself and you don't find the pang of an unsettled, behavior that you know the Lord doesn't approve. So your conscience says, you know, man, I'm in trouble. You know, what am I going to do now? So, uh, the Bible promises a pure conscience. And that for a deacon. So any other position, I think, deserves just as much. And let these also first be proved. So that's kind of the same thing as not a novice. Uh, let's, let's watch them and check it. Make sure that, you know, everything is in order. That's an important part of church life. And let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. You know, Brother Fred doesn't have any quirks. You know, any, uh, any secret uh, side uh, occasions that are meant to be hidden. Even so, must their wives be grave. So, isn't that interesting? That ministry, the quality, the qualification for ministry uh, includes more of the household. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanders. Be careful what you say about people that you disapprove of. You know, slander is easy to slip into. The news is full of it, just one slander after another. Don't participate in that. Sober, faithful in all things. You can count on them. Every time, everywhere, you can count on them. Faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Same deal, I think. Ruling their children and their house well. So we see multiple ministries, the same requirement. If you can't, can't get it done at home, uh, you ought to wait a little bit. 
you've got some learning to do. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So uh, there's, there's a reward, there's a benefit of carrying out your duties vigilantly, carefully, uh, with compassion, with determination, with skill, uh, and boldness of faith is a reward of that. These things I write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly, and I, I think the scholars are agree that, that didn't happen. Second uh, Timothy is Paul's last book. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, and how many behave, everyone needs to behave, which is the church of the living God. And so there's a certain demeanor and a certain decorum that's required in church. And over the years, I've noticed that that has subsided a great deal, especially uh, in matters of dress, you know, wearing a T-shirt, split dungarees has become fashionable. I began serving in a church as an associate pastor at one church. I wore a coat and tie. And the pastor came to me and said, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, take it off. <laughs> I did because he asked me to, but boy, did I, uh, I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, you know, there's uh, the way you dress. It gives honor to the occasion. which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's our major difficulty, especially here in the United States, is that a pillar is what holds things up. And our, our pillar, I think, Ben, is a little too flexible. And the ground of truth is... Um, we are inflicted with... It's a... It's a virtue that we've decided that our opinion is the real deal. And it, boy, I, I, I run into that regularly. Just what I think is, by golly, that, that's it. No argument. And so, uh, let me remind you, I don't like repeating myself much, but, uh, I'll repeat this. For me, the gift of teaching is characterized this way. When I teach, I can teach you something that you already know. I can teach you something that you don't know. Or I can teach you something where you believe the exact opposite. You don't believe what I'm saying. Those three things. Of those three things, I think only two are teaching. I don't think it's teaching at all if you tell someone something that they already know. And you know that's happening because they're nodding, Amen, brother, preach it. You know? But that's not teaching. There's no advancement there. If I'm correct, then teaching requires you to hear something you've never heard before or to hear something that you don't believe. And so hold your belief system gingerly and don't react so fast i don't you know i don't believe that you know it's like maybe the lord wants to, to teach you something and maybe not maybe maybe what's being said is truly an error but uh it's line upon line and precept upon precept and you don't arrive at the destination after a couple of decades of uh, serving the lord you know it's like we now have it all figured out and just ask me you know? I'll set you straight. You know, it's not a problem. Whereas, in my judgment, the modern church is lacking an enormous percentage of the Christian life. It could be as much as 80%, 90%. It's missing. It's in the scriptures, but it's missing from practice. It's missing from beliefs. Uh, so that's my burden, is to touch on those things. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. 
we need to hear more of the mysteries of God. It's resisted in the modern church, but there are things that are not known that God knows. And the reason why we don't know them is because they're not written down in the scripture. And the Bible promises us one of the functions of the Lord is to reveal those secrets to us. And so are we ready for that, or will we cringe and say such a thing is not even possible? I mean, if it's not in the Bible, it's not true. Well, that's not a safe place. It's not safe at all, because you shut the door. For example, Joseph, the, uh, Joseph and Mary. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, don't be fearful to take Mary as your wife. So, is there no allowance then for an angel to say the same, to say something to you in a dream? You know, cancel your vacation plans because you need it elsewhere? So you don't find that. You don't find vacation plans in the Bible. And so what it does, it closes the book on the supernatural. It closes the book of uh, concerning the prophetic, of walking in the Spirit, of going before the Lord. He that has his ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And the Spirit doesn't quote Bible to you when he's talking to you. He, he has things to say to you, and we're required to hear it. You will not hear it if you believe the only source of truth comes from ink on paper. And so I know that's difficult. Uh, there are whole denominations that are built on that. But uh, my request of you is re relax a little. Just give the Lord a little edge there. See if he won't uh, train you a little better. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And so that's one of the mysteries. Justified in the spirit. Wow, that's deep stuff. So, the purpose of these careful instructions and a, and a number of them are repeated. A number of them uh, are the same in uh, other writings of Paul, or for that matter, Peter. And so sometimes the uh, the repetition causes you, to, you know, your eyes to gloss over and not particularly recognize uh, that this is fire. This is something for you. And so. One of the incredible things about the scriptures is that you can pick it up and read it and see something you've never seen before. That's how incredible it is. And so don't give it second place. Give it a high priority daily if you possibly can. And the same with prayer. Daily if you possibly can. Uh, join yourself with the holy things of heaven and you'll Find yourself dwelling in that realm rather than just understanding it. You'll actually be living it. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the grandeur of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction, the careful instruction that you give us, and especially in the matter of functioning in ministry, Lord. We're all ears, and we want to do it your way. We don't want to be inventive. Thank you, Lord, for each one who's here tonight. We pray that your blessing be upon all. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.